Welcome, welcome everybody. Welcome to our National Health Association Power Your Health Q&A. Uh, if you're coming on in, then just go ahead, type your name. Well, your name's going to be in there. Just type in where you're coming from. We'd love to hear Marsha's here, Greta's here, Karen's here. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. We're super excited to have another uh, doctor here on the scene with us. We've gotten a lot of questions uh, for Dr. Esser and tonight we have a conversation about exercise coming in. So just drop in, Carol, you're here. Awesome to see you. We're so excited to, uh, to be going tonight. And um, just a quick intro to the Power Your Health Q&A. Every month on the fourth Tuesday at 4 p.m., Pacific time, we come together here with a special guest who is here to answer your questions about your health. Uh, today's about exercise and other things. So tonight we've got Dr. Esser, who um, Mark Huberman will introduce here in just a second. But thanks so much for coming. I'm gonna let him come on in, um, introduce Mark Huberman, the president of the National Health Association. Hi, Michelle, and hi everybody out there in the, uh, in the uh, internet land. Great to hear. Uh, great to see you all. And uh, you're you're uh, rolling in as I'm seeing the list, which is really exciting. Uh, I am really excited about uh, this month's guest. Uh, Dr. Stefan Esser uh, is uh, very special to the Huberman family and very special to the NHA because he is the grandson of the legendary Dr. William Esser, who was a co-founder of the National Health Association, formerly called the American Natural Hygiene Society. And um, in my humble book, one of the great human beings to ever walk the planet, let alone one of the great hygienic physicians to ever walk the planet, one of the brightest guys I've ever met. And there's an old saying that, um, that a very hygienic saying that apples don't fall far from the tree. Uh, there were lots of mango trees at Dr. Esser's health ranch. Uh, so without further ado, I want to introduce the true apple, uh, the apple of Dr. the late Dr. Esser's eye, Dr. William Esser, uh, Dr. Stefan Esser. Stefan, good to see you. Mark, it's a pleasure to join you as always. Thanks for the invite. And thanks hey, to everybody who's joining tonight. I see some names that I know on the list popping up and a lot of newbies. So excited to share the message with you all tonight. So Stefan, just for a moment, how about if you give a thumbnail background of your uh, background in education? Absolutely. So I'm a fourth generation plant-based eater. Uh, I had the pleasure of being the grandson of Dr. William L. Esser, as you suggested. Uh, who really was one of the most powerful forces for good in my life, and I know in tens of thousands of other people. Uh, as a result of his inspiration, running Esser's Ranch, where people came and fasted and detoxified for decades, for 65 years, I was attracted to medicine. Went off to the University of South Florida for medical school, Harvard for residency, Mayo Clinic for fellowship, and I've now had the pr uh, pleasure of being in practice, uh, working in orthopedics uh, and sports medicine here in Jacksonville, Florida. And I've been on faculty uh, for three different uh, medical residencies and fellowships, uh, as well as the team physician for the Division I University of North Florida, all their athletics. So a lot of different hats, a lot of opportunity to help people, and uh, excited to take any questions tonight that I can answer and provide value to your uh, attendees. And I see over your uh, right shoulder is a tennis racket. If I That's right. Know. Tennis is in the Esser blood. So tell me about your tennis background. Yes, you know, tennis, there were two tennis courts at Esser's Ranch, and then my father built a 15-court tennis club right across the street from Esser's Ranch. So tennis truly is in our blood. And uh, I had the pleasure of playing collegiate and then was number one in the U.S. in men's open doubles in 2002. Uh, so certainly a passion of mine. And right now we're standing on Esser's Ranch, the new Esser's Ranch in Ponte Vedra Beach, Florida. And as we speak, there's a tennis court being completed uh, over on the acreage right here. So uh, excited to bring it back to the, uh, the ground level here. So the question is, do you have any mango trees there yet? Unfortunately not. We're above the freeze zone. So, uh, you know, that's the one thing I regret about being this far north. Very good. Well, uh, again, uh, because you're an orthopedist and, and as well as hygienist, we've got a lot of questions about uh, fitness and health and exercise and all that. So let's uh, just get right to some of them. Um, and there is a disease that I have never heard of called a du du Dupree trend, D U. P R E Y T R E N S. Yeah. And it says, uh, ask, wonder if Dr. Esser has had any success with reversing and improving this disease with diet and lifestyle. And any advice? <laughs> she was diagnosed about it, or this person was diagnosed about a year ago, uh, and not a lot of impact at this point. Been eating SOS free. Any, uh, yep. any, any experience and any guidance you have? So, Dupuytren's contracture is where there's an increased fibrosis of the flexor tendons of the hand. 
so you can bend your hands because they're little ropes called flexor tendons. But it appears that there's a genetic and environmental uh, sort of disease process that causes these tendons to thicken and shorten. As a result, the person starts with fibrous cords in the hand, and then over time they start shortening and tightening the hand down. Arguably, it seems this occurs more commonly in people of Scandinavian descent who may be at, uh, had alcohol consumption during their lifetime, but it's not always a one-to-one -one, you know, relationship. So it, it does appear to be genetically predisposed and then environment you know, pulls the trigger as they say. Uh, so I tell people that you, know, you wanna do gentle stretches, topical solves and creams, things that reduce inflammation in the hand, uh, but no, it does not appear that it's a one-to-one, -one, you, know, you eat that plant-based diet, it may not uh, reverse this disease process, but certainly reduces inflammation everywhere else and your diseases of all the common, or the, your risk of all the common diseases. Uh, if your flexor in deformity gets bad enough, then there you can get injections of collagenase, an enzyme that breaks up the fibrous tissues or surgery if need be. Gentle stretches, topical creams, excellent nutrition for all the other reasons and keep on having fun. So I got the next question is one that, uh, that I get, that we all get a lot and we all suffer a lot. This is about a lightly sprained ankle. So what is the best way to treat or to, to deal with a lightly sprained ankle? My doctor suggests taking off a splint that supports it and use it more now that the swelling is down. And there's just a little discomfort. Is that a good idea? Is acupuncture helpful? Again, these kind of light sprains, <laughs> you cold, cold, you know, do you use ice? Do you use warmth? Do you, do, yeah. do you mobilize it? What's, or do, you, do you tighten, wrap it tight? What's the best yeah. advice these days? I mean, I think the most important thing is making sure the diagnosis is accurate. You'll probably hear me say that a lot tonight. The reality is when you roll your ankle badly enough for significant swelling, uh, you also can fracture your ankle and you can get stress injuries in the ankle. So you just want to make sure. So if you roll the ankle, it swells up. It's a little bit bruised, but within five to 10 days, swelling's down. Majority of pain, you're 90% better. It was probably just an ankle sprain. And so initially protecting it, allowing the inflammation to kind of take its effect to protect your ankle, draw growth factors there to help with healing, that's all appropriate. Aggressively icing it two or three times, excuse me, a day for the first five days, also good. So protection and some icing and elevation, always a good choice. By seven to 10 days though, that ankle should be feeling a lot better. If it's not, then you need to ask the question, did I get the right diagnosis? Or do I actually have a little bit of a stress injury or possible fracture? If it's tender right over the bone, especially, probably want to get an x-ray or get into a boot, really protect that area. You don't want to miss that fracture, and then you go walking on it for two or three weeks, and now it's worse than it needed to be. Once the swelling's down, the pain's down, et cetera, now's the time for some alphabets, right? Start a little bit of alphabets with your toes, little band exercises, and then some single leg balance work, and then progress back to sport and activity. But go slow and make sure the diagnosis is accurate. Same viewer also asks about uh, acupuncture. Acupuncture yeah. for any value for sprained ankles or for anything else for that matter. Yeah, so acupuncture, 3,000 years of history. I've been doing acupuncture for the last 10 years of my career, about 1,000 procedure, you know, acupuncture visits a year for patients. I can tell you about 70 to 80% of people have a good response. Uh, so that's not everybody, but it has its place. For things like back pain, neck pain, shoulder pain, definitely you can get some short-term and sometimes long-term benefits. So low risk intervention, reasonable mechanism of how it works, and uh, so reasonable to try. As what is, as, the, uh, what is what is the mechanism? So three different ways that we know in the medical literature. One is that when you place a delicate needle through the skin, it increases blood flow. It causes vasodilatation. So more blood flows into the area where you place the needle. Increasing blood increases oxygen and nutrition delivery, which helps areas to heal and be healthier. Number two. It results in the release of endorphins, something called metenkephalin in the spinal cord and beta endorphin in the brain. These are, if you will, endogenous opioids, meaning your own hydrocodone that your body releases. So it reduces pain. And number three, studies we did at Harvard show that when you get acupuncture, you decrease the activation of the thalamus, the part of the brain related to pain. So now we have less chronic pain due to deactivation of the thalamus in the central nervous system. So three well-proven ways it works. And then of course, there's lots of mystery with the traditional Chinese medicine approaches of what else it may do for the individual. So low risk, reasonable way that it works. And I'd encourage people to give it a try. Very good. Another one that uh, concerns, I have a, a number of questions about osteopenia, osteoarthritis, 
Um, yeah. and, and, and that. And so the first question is, uh, I have osteopenia. Should I be limiting food with potassium, such as legumes and bananas? I've been whole food plant-based for six years, no alcohol, 65 years old, run 40 minutes away. Uh, I had radiation treatment in 2005 for breast cancer. Any food exercise recommendations? Thanks for your kindness. Osteopenia. So, yeah, osteopenia. So remember that for each of us, as we grow in age, our bones, uh, which are like little boxes, if you will, they begin to thicken and become denser inside. And so by the time a woman reaches about 35, on average, her bone density has peaked. And now as she ages over time with estrogen declining, with many women having children, literally the bone density begins to reduce by about 1% per year. That's the average. Now, there are things you can do to accelerate that process, make it worse, like a high salt diet, high amounts of caffeine, inadequate nutrition, poor vitamin D status, inadequate exercise, excess of alcohol consumption. All of these play a part, as well as many medications can negatively affect bone health. So the key for those of you who are plant-based faithfully long-term is to make sure you're getting adequate amounts of those deep green vegetables, loads of vitamin K2, that you're getting good sunlight exposure, 30 minutes or so to the arms, legs, back, and chest every day if possible. Checking your vitamin D levels, making sure they're at a healthy place. Checking your thyroid function, making sure it's not off. And then making sure if all those numbers look good, everything else is well balanced, then we take a look at our exercise regime. We need to be doing resistance types training. Now, it needs to be 60% of what's called your one rep max, meaning quite a bit of demand on the tendons, muscles, and bones in order to actually maintain the integrity of your bones. So picking up the five pound weights, that ain't gonna cut it. Doing a few band exercise, that's not enough. We need to actually be pushing the muscles, bones, and tendons pretty hard with resistance style training to actually make a big impact on the bone density. Then, he almost as important is gonna be working on flexibility, balance, and reaction time. Very few people break their hips if they can quickly catch themselves as they stumble or fall. But it's when they stumble or fall, that's when they get into trouble. So the quicker you are, the lighter you are on your feet, doing things like line dances, ballroom dancing, tai chi, sports like tennis, activities where you're changing direction quickly. These are very protective for the bones, the overall body, for total function long-term. So maximize the nutrition, reduce the toxic exposures, maximize the exercise, and then re-evaluate that bone density over time. So in osteopenia, if I understand right, that's just kind of the precursor to osteoporosis. It's just a low level loss of some of the bone density. And the reality is, it's very normal for our bodies to slow down a bit. We don't want the estrogen levels in a woman to be the same they were when she was 20. Because when those estrogen levels, for example, which are bone density building molecules, right? Well, if that estrogen stays high long-term, that woman increases the risk of breast cancer, uterine cancer, and the list goes on. Just like for a gentleman, he does not want his testosterone to be through the roof like it may have been when he was 16 because testosterone is a growth hormone. And the problem is when you have elevated growth hormone going through your bloodstream all long-term, you increase the risk of growth. But what is cancer? Uncontrolled growth. That's all it is. So we don't want those elevated amounts of hormones in the bloodstream long-term. So yeah, we want to... Osteopenia, a little low level osteopenia, pretty normal as we age into our 60s and 70s. Nothing to be particularly concerned about, but certainly something always good to work on bone density, strength, balance, coordination, reaction time for overall function. Do you recommend that people as they get to their 50s and 60s to have a routine DEXA scan to kind of see where they are? You know, so it depends. If you have a strong family history and you've had, you know, uh, so in other words, high risk of kind of osteoporosis, if you're a slender white female who's postmenopausal, uh, you know, I think the, it's relatively low risk to do at some point in your life, whether it be at 50 or whether it be 55 or 60, uh, to have that data can be worthwhile. Uh, so just like having cardiac CTs or having cardiac minimal medial thickness tests on the ultrasound, just like knowing your cholesterol level, some of these things can be of value. Uh, so just kind of to plan accordingly. So another question related to you said about resistance training and that doing heavier weights. A woman says, uh, I love I believe, a 65 year old woman uh, with osteoarthritis and a hip replacement. I love walking and bike riding and never feel the need to avoid these activities. However, I can't seem to get enthusiastic about weight resistance training. I know that's the best exercise, but how do I how do I get inspired and motivated to do that? 
Well, the first thing is congratulations that you're being active. You know, only about 10% of adults over the age of 60 actually are active every day and achieving the recommended amounts of activity. So kudos to you. That's the first thing. Affirm yourself and say, look, I'm a motivated, health-minded individual. And so the reality is, well, a motivated, health-minded individual makes changes according to their health goals. You've expressed a desire to be maximally healthy, maximally vital, maximally functional. And so what I just tell you is, try some. You might be surprised. Start with a little bit of weight and begin to build from there. You don't have to go all in right away, but begin a little bit, build a little bit more. See if you can find a workout partner. See if there's a class that you've heard good things about that you'd enjoy. Or maybe if there's a well-respected personal trainer in your area or a physical therapist who offers strength coaching, perhaps consider that. See how it feels. Add in a little bit. You might suddenly go, wow, this feels good in my skin to feel a little bit of muscle in my forearms or in my quads or in my chest wall or my upper back. I can now lift that box a little easier or push that basket of fresh veggies or whatever it might be much easier. That's the real advantage of the exercise is about the functional ability that you maintain that high quality of life and ability. Whenever I really get serious about my resistance training, I love how easy it is to stand up, how simple it is to walk the stairs, how easy it is to carry my children. All of a sudden, it's so much easier because I've been pushing heavier weights than they are. You know, back in the day in medical school, we talked about, well, if your test is going to be this hard, you need to make sure you're studying this hard, not that you're studying here. So the same idea for life. If you're wanting to be this active, well, you need to train here, not down here, because that's how you, otherwise you end up with injury. So if you like to be able to lift the planter on the back porch and move it, right, or lift that heavy box of books from the one place to the other, or do these sort of activities, you want to maintain good strength and not suddenly do something that you're unprepared for. That's how you get an injury. Well, I got to say amen to that, Dr. Esser. Uh, in terms of that motivation, um, I find that when I connected with a personal trainer, it is something I look forward to. He pushes me. Uh, it's it's a nice crowd you're with. But I don't think if I, if I had to do it on my own, I have all the weights in the world. During COVID, Wanda and I bought all this equipment in the basement. But it isn't the same as going right. and having somebody put you through the paces and and you schedule it, you put it as part of your routine. Yep. And um, I feel better doing it, but I know that it's better for it. it, it it's, it's, it's that little extra push yep. that I found really helpful. Right. Well, that's the key is identifying what works for you and then making sure that you're putting that into your weekly, monthly routine. And just a reminder for those people that are asking are 65, you know, if you're like me, senior, uh, uh, senior uh, silver sneakers is available. Right. If you have a Medicare supplement plan, which most people do. You that's can go it. to the Y, you can go to almost any gym for free. That's and, it. Uh, so it's a great, that's, you, you can't let, cost isn't in the way for that. Yeah. It's a good deal. All right. So someone else, again, related to this osteoporosis and that, uh, a woman says that I am currently healing from a compres compression fracture in the lumbar area of my mm. spine, and I want to prevent this from happening again. Uh, what should she be doing? Same well, the first, yeah, I mean, the first thing is to identify why it happened, right? Was it that uh, you lifted something that you were unaccustomed to and it was just too much for your body? So the bone, which was weak, just crushed. That's what a compression fracture is. Was it because you had a major trauma? Was it because you've had radiation for cancer? You know, any of these other things that can be occurring. So the first thing is to understand why did this happen? And then what can I do to prevent it? So if it was due to inadequate conditioning and then suddenly heavy lifting with poor mechanics, well, clearly, once this compression fracture is healed with time, with bracing, with whatever is needed, then we need to focus in on core strength, upper back, mid back strength to stabilize that area better and then maintain that excellent strength so you can lift, move, heft, et cetera, without that same risk. Now, if it was due to something else, like that you have poor bone density, again, like we said, we need to address that. Number three is if it's due to some unknown cause, you need to get that worked up, perhaps even an MRI of the area, make sure there's no malignancy or cancer or anything else that could cause that bone to be weak. So get the right diagnosis, let it heal over the six weeks to 12 weeks, whatever it takes, and then a good strengthening, postural awareness, total body strength, core strength protocol after that. Got it. So another question is, uh, what would you recommend for my 79-year-old father who has muscle wasting and continues to lose weight, 
uh, and has hypothyroidism. Um, do you think he should eat chicken and fish or just add more plant-based protein and omega-3s? Yeah, so I think the first thing is to identify, I, so again, I would gather data. So I'd write down everything your father eats for two weeks without changing anything. I would look then at how many calories, how much fat, how much protein, how much carbohydrate, how much micronutrition, all of those things. And I would evaluate that first. Then based on what you find, right? How many total calories are being consumed? Is it purely because he's not eating adequate calories and that's all it is, right? Or is it rather because there's a specific micronutrient or macronutrient that's lacking? Uh, that's the first thing to check. If he's eating, let's say, so I, what I would usually do is I'd go on, I'd calculate his basic metabolic rate. You can look that up online, Google search, calculate basic metabolic rate, see how many calories are required to maintain weight, and then add 500 calories to that. Then look at what he eats every day for two weeks and see if he's achieving that intake. You may find he needs 2,000 calories or 2,200 to gain weight, but he's only eating 1,400. Well, then it doesn't matter what he's eating. He's not getting enough calories. And so you need to add more total calories. Ideally, we'd like to stay in the healthy calories, like calorie-dense foods, like the dried fruits, the nuts, the seeds, the avocado, et cetera, if we need to gain some weight and not go to the animal flesh or the processed foods that have so many other negative side effects. Because it does us no good for the frail elderly person to gain some fat and then stroke out or have the heart attack three months later. That was a pretty useless end goal, right? You didn't achieve what you wanted. So instead, we want to gain the weight in a natural, healthy way, and then we need to get the moving and exercising because exercise stimulates appetite for many people who are over the age of 65, and then it helps with lean muscle mass building, et cetera. So number one, check the basic metabolic rate, see how many calories are required for survival, and then how much to gain weight. Number two, track the calories over two weeks, see if they're even achieving the recommended. Number three, identify calorie-dense plant-based foods, including perhaps plant-based smoothies, which is an easy way to get more total calories and go from there and build moving forward. If despite getting adequate calories and eating healthfully over time, they're still losing weight, then we need to think there may be a cancer, a tumor, a mass, something else that's going on that is slowing absorption using excess energy. So the thing that most seniors worry about are the two sides, bone loss mm -hmm. and muscle and maintaining muscle, maintaining mm -hmm. muscle mass of that. And I just was watching a, somebody recommended me an interesting podcast, uh, Rich Roll had done with Simon Hill, who talked a lot about, about um, a, a strong advocate of a whole food plant-based diet and just, but just said, you know, as you get older, kind of this is like the Walter Longo kind of principle, but as you get older, you need to pay a little more attention to protein and getting it from plant sources and some of these plant powders and you know pea powders and things like that can be an addition to your smoothie to help you maintain get the, you know that all those amino acids your leucine all these things and i guess what is your take on the value of that as we get older is protein something that we need to pay more attention to um, as people get older to maintain that muscle mass no but a broad calorie dense comprehensive program is what's required so many people begin to seriously limit their diets as they age, their teeth, their dentition, their digestion, their personal choices, their favoritism, et cetera. They go to this tea and toast diet, which is completely inadequate for excellent nutrition in the individual. So what's key is maintaining adequate calorie intake, right? With a micronutrient dense, well-balanced program. That's what's going to be essential. Now, the people who talk about proteins and all this, many of them are just wanting to sell product. And that's okay. They can sell all the product they want. But that's not the answer for the majority of people the majority of time. So the key, again, is if you're just sitting down and having a little bit of iceberg lettuce with a few carrot sticks, that's not going to cut it. That's not the sort of program that we encourage people uh, you know, to kind of eat long term. Okay. Another, uh, another um, uh, exercise injury sort of thing. And Wanda could be asking this question, what about recurring ankle injuries? What do you do prophylactically or preventatively to prevent uh, someone who, who uh, has sprained their ankle several times, is prone to twisting ligament injuries? Anything you can do to, should you be wearing higher boots, should be using ankle weights? What's the recommendation for people who seem to not just get unlucky and trip, but actually are prone to yeah. turning their ankle, things like that? 
So after you've rolled your ankle multiple times, you can develop something called chronic ankle instability or functional ankle instability, FAI or CAI is the term medically. And this is where now we have the ligaments are so stretched out that you chronically have instability. There's a little looseness in the ankle. Any uneven surface you're on and suddenly the ankle little gives out, right? And we get another injury. So the studies are pretty clear on this. The first thing to do is about six weeks of excellent rehabilitation. Most of us are slackers, let's be honest. We do some rehab for a week or two. We're like, yeah, I'm done. I'm good to go. Let's go out and play sports. Let's go for my hike. No, 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 no. We're talking about faithful six weeks, alphabet, single leg stances, clocks, all of these different things, the band exercises, build, 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 build until you can do these band exercises with your ankle with blue and black bands, not just red and little wimpy yellow bands. So we've got to build up the strength of the muscles that stabilize the ankle. If you've done that for six to 10 weeks and despite your best effort, it's still not right. The next thing to say is, well, do you have something else going on here? Like a neurologic impairment where a nerve is pinched in your low back or a neuropathy in your legs where you don't feel things as well. That's number one. Number two would be to say, all right, well, if all those other things check out, now we need to talk about something that stabilizes the ankle, like some prolotherapy, which is the use of dextrose solution into the ligaments that helps tighten them up or a little bit of some PRP, platelet-rich plasma, which I do, into the ligaments or into the joint that helps to stabilize. These are the things that we want to do. But it's essential, rehab, 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 for that ankle when it gets injured. Just like you want to reverse, prevent that heart disease, fruits, veggies, fruits, veggies, fruits, veggies, fruits, veggies, again and again. Uh, so again, the two big pillars are going to be nutrition and exercise. And as Joseph Pilates said, Physical fitness cannot be obtained by outright purchase nor wishful thinking. It comes from the hard work and the dedication, or as Jack LaLanne said, life's a pain in the butt. You got to work at it. And so that's the reality with those recurrent ankle injuries for the majority of people, the majority of time, not enough rehab. Very good. Um, so another question related to a sprained ankle. So he says, what about what are your thoughts about uh, if we, when you, when you have the pain from a sprained ankle, taking ibuprofen. Do these kind of things, will this promote healing? Will this compromise healing? Uh, great question. So ibuprofen works by blocking the conversion of arachidonic acid to prostaglandins. When people go on a 100% plant-based program, so I teach people about this in my four-week nutritional virtual detox that I do with people um, that's on my website. And uh, is the reality is as soon as you go 100% plant-based, you take arachidonic acid, the majority of it out of your diet. Because the majority of arachidonic acid comes from the meat, the dairies, the refined foods that we consume. And so when you take that out of your diet, now you're no longer eating the precursor molecule that breaks down to form the most common inflammatory molecule in the body, which are called prostaglandins. All that ibuprofen, Motrin, Aleve, Naproxen, Duexis, Vimova, all those drugs, all they do is block the conversion of arachidonic acid down to prostaglandins. So why not just stop eating so much arachidonic acid, and now you don't have as much of that to form the prostaglandins. And that's why people on a plant-based diet, on average, have less inflammatory joint pain. So the first thing is that. Number two is ibuprofen, Motrin, Aleve are the leading causes of gastric ulceration and admission to a hospital with a GI bleed. It's crucial people understand these drugs are toxins. They're not friendly to the body. They have major side effects. They're not water. People are like, oh, I have a headache. Oh, I have period cramps. Oh, my knee hurts. Oh, my back hurts. Let me take an anti-inflammatory. What are you doing? You're taking a drug that increases your risk of a heart attack and a stroke. The studies are very clear on this uh, over time as you take it. Increasing your risk of gastric ulceration, GI bleeds, kidney failure, elevated blood pressure, and studies show that taking anti-inflammatories prolongs viral shedding when you have an upper respiratory viral illness. There are so many reasons not to take those drugs. So what we should be doing is using natural approaches like ice, heat, TENS unit, acupuncture, lymphatic massage, compression, the use of supplements like turmeric, boswellia, ginger, the use of topical solves like arnica, and the list goes on. These are the sorts of things we should be maximizing in our life and using the drugs only as a second, third, or fourth tier approach. And when you use them for very short periods, not long term. Your grandfather would be smiling at that answer. I am an Esser. <laughs> All right. Another a couple more uh, questions again on um, exercise. Uh, best exercise for seniors and brain health. 
Yeah. So anything you're willing to do and anything that pushes you out of your comfort zone a little bit and anything that creates a little muscle confusion, that'd be the term. So most studies would suggest that altering your workouts over time is actually extremely good for your cognitive function. So for me, for example, I go and hit some tennis balls. That's not particularly stimulating. It is if I'm playing a match, it's that I have to move, I have to twist, I have to turn, I'm thinking through the shots, et cetera. But I've done it so many millions of times, literally, that these are well-known neural networks in my brain. But when I go and do something like a boot camp class I've never done, or a Pilates class on a reformer, those are things I've almost never done that challenge my body and my brain to coordinate this and coordinate that. The other night, I, for example, did some ballroom dancing. Haven't done it for years. That challenged my brain in very new and different ways. So what I'd encourage people to do is identify things within their functional capacity that challenge them in ways they are a little uncomfortable and get out of their comfort zone. So you might not like doing the Roomba. Great. It's time for a Roomba class, right? You may not like doing the cha-cha. Well, it's time for you to do some cha-cha, baby, right? You may not like doing the Pilates or trying out some swimming, et cetera. What you want to avoid are activities that put you at high risk. So for example, going to a boot camp class with a trainer that doesn't know what they're doing, who starts yelling at you like you're a 20-year-old, you know, who's a, in a fit college athlete, that's not going to be the best choice for your shoulders. That's how you tear your rotator cuff or do things of that kind. But you need to challenge yourself. So the people who I ask you to say, hey, what's your exercise routine? And they say, well, I walk every day. I'm like, yeah, what, what are you doing? What are you preparing for? Like death? Because you're walking. Like that's not enough. Walking is a great way to see the environment, to see the neighborhood. If you're 95 years old and have two knee replacements, fine, walking's okay. But otherwise, walking's not enough. We need to work on balance, coordination. We need to work on strength. The, F, the CDC, the NIH, all the major institutions say the same thing. We should be seeking 150 minutes per week of cardiovascular exercise. We should be doing strength training one to two days per week. And we should be doing balance and flexibility one to two days per week. And then you should be mixing and matching over time. This results in arborization in the brain, which means you grow new neurons. You grow new neurons. You expand your mental capacity rather than limiting it down to just a few telephone wires. No, you want a broad spectrum, a very arborized nervous system. So as you lose some of those neurons over time, which we all do, you have many others to take up the place. This is an interesting question that would be right out of your uh, grandfather's uh, uh, handbook. Someone says, is fasting for cervical herniated disc, is, 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 have, has there been any an advantage to anyone with these kind of mechanical body physical <laughs> problems does does a period of fasting improve harm benefit i always say two things about that number one is you're very unlikely to die of back pain or neck pain uh, you're very unlikely to die of knee pain or shoulder pain very unlikely unless it's a cancer or a tumor etc and so the reality is there are two parts to that one you want to improve your function reduce pain and improve your quality of life two you don't want to die right? Because otherwise, what good does it do if you're very functional and you just die? Not helpful. So when you fast, you reduce your risk of dying because you reduce generalized inflammation. You reduce and drop cardio, cardiovascular risk factor biomarkers. Nice study by Alan Goldhammer just showed this, et cetera. So fasting is always a worthwhile intervention to consider as a foundation for good and excellent health. Now, during the time of fasting, miracles do happen sometimes. And so if you've got a disc herniation that's significant, number one, you may just reduce inflammation and your pain goes away. Number two, you may in fact reduce swelling in the disc so it doesn't push out as far and be compressing your nerves. Number three, it may not help you at all, but you will have reduced your risk of death, cardiovascular risk, cancer, and many other causes of common death in humans. So a good fast, if you can do it, and if your BMI is over about 18 or 19, so you're otherwise healthy and not emaciated, a nice little short fast under supervision, outstanding. See if it helps. Very good. I, uh, another question, uh, again, uh, a variation on the theme about chronic knee sw uh, swelling. And the particular person said the doctor uh, prescribed a PRP treatment and wondering the value of a PRP treatment, which uh, I don't even know what that is. So I'm sure you do. PRP is platelet-rich plasma. It's a form of biologic treatment. It's been around for about 15 years. I've done thousands of them for patients over the last 10 years. 
what I can tell you is the idea is that platelets are tiny little cells in your bloodstream. They're only about 2% of the volume of your blood. But when you take the blood, put it in a centrifuge and spin it down, you remove the red blood cells, you remove the plasma, and you're left now with a very rich combination of water, the plasma, and platelets, these little cells that have 60 different types of growth factors. So it's kind of like taking water and fertilizer and putting it on your knee. If you've got, right, some mild to moderate arthritis in your knee, doing some PRP is very reasonable. And studies would suggest better, healthier, and more efficacious than steroids and gel injections. So very reasonable to do. Low risk if done by somebody who knows what they're doing. And uh, yeah, so worth trying. Another interesting question. Uh, partially talks about how can I regain uh, the range of motion in both my partially frozen shoulders? I do PT exercise daily, but can't seem to get all the range of motion. It's been two and a half years for one shoulder and nine months for the second one. Have you ever dealt with frozen shoulder syndrome? Thousands of people. So oh. one of the unique, yeah, one of the unique procedures I do is called a hydro distension. It's a procedure done under ultrasound guidance in which I inject a large volume, 90 cc's of salt water and numbing medication inside a person's shoulder. It expands the shoulder and gives them back the range of motion. I've done over 2,000 of them in the last three years alone. So I've tracked every single patient. We see on average people get 30 to 80 degrees more motion. This procedure is called a shoulder hydrodilation or a shoulder hydrodistension. Excellent studies out of Europe and Asia. I've tracked all my patients 90%. It's one and done. Another 10% require doing it two or three times for full results. And unfortunately, not a lot of people do it in the U.S. because it does not generate a lot of money. That's why it's not done. Insurance, I do it. Cover? insurance covers it. And so all you do is charge as a nerve block, which is part of what we do for the procedure. Uh, so low risk. I've done, as I said, over 2,000, never had an infection, bleeding, or nerve injury. But those are the risks of what could happen with it. So if this, uh, this uh, shoulder is not behaving itself, uh, a shoulder hydro distension is outstanding for this. Also, make sure your nutrition is spot on. Consider a short-term fast or even just a juice detoxification uh, for about two weeks and see what happens. Very good. Uh, on the last, I think, physical question I got relates to spinal stenosis. We see more and more people as they're aging or bending over and, and any, uh, any dietary <laughs> regimens to help with that or any other kind of yeah, so spinal stenosis is a narrowing of the spinal col column where the nerves travel through. It's secondary on average to a combination of arthritis and disc bulges that crowd out the central canal. And as a result, it makes it more narrow. So when you lean forward, it opens up space. That feels better. When you lean back, it makes it tighter. So most people who have spinal stenosis have the classic old man or old woman's posture, and they bend forward to open up the spinal canal. Now, studies show that if you have atherosclerosis, which is hardening of your arteries due to the standard American diet, that in fact, you have higher rates of spinal degeneration, which then leads to spinal stenosis. So number one, I have people do, are you overweight? Are you obese? We need to lose and shed that weight because it's pulling your spine forward, leading to more spinal stenosis. Had tons of people do my four-week detox, lose 25, 30 pounds, and their spinal stenosis symptoms go away, which is beautiful. Number two, though, we want that whole food plant-based diet long-term to improve blood flow and see if we can decrease inflammation and have you get less pain. On occasion, this is inadequate. If that's inadequate, we go with good therapies and acupuncture. If that's inadequate, we go to spinal injections. And if that's inadequate, we go with surgery. So these are kind of the stepwise progressions. Got it. So let's get to, uh, there's a, a number of other uh general house call doctor questions here. One of them just popped up on the screen. Thoughts on high cholesterol. Thoughts on high cholesterol for a person who eats whole food plant-based SOS free. I'm 60 and can't figure out why I have high cholesterol. Cholesterol is formed in two ways, either A, by the consumption of cholesterol in our diet, and number two, by the liver itself. Uh, some people have hypertriglyceridemia or familial hypertriglyceridemia or familiar hypercholesterolemia uh, in which they have elevated cholesterol levels chronically due to their genetic inheritance. And so the reality is some people just chronically have elevated cholesterol. The first thing always is to be honest, 100%. Are you 1000% being faithful on your plant-based program? And if you are, okay. Number two is to look at other foods you're consuming. High saturated fat foods like in coconut and the like tend to prompt the liver 
to produce more total cholesterol. So elevated saturated or increased consumption of saturated fats will prompt your liver to produce more cholesterol on its own. So do you have familiar hypercholesterolemia or are you consuming too much saturated fat that is then leading to your liver producing excess amounts of cholesterol? I always tell people, do a good four to six weeks cleanup, make sure it's 100%. Do a quick juice program for two weeks, inadequate. Consider a fast under supervision for a prolonged period, still inadequate. You might be one of those people who benefit from a low dose statin or red yeast rice or goo galls or some of these other things to reduce their resting cholesterol. Uh, Ann has, uh, Ann about 10 minutes ago posted a question. I missed most of the talk about bone loss. I'm a small frame and 61 years old, just recently prescribed meds for this. I already do yoga. What do you think about yoga as, a, as an adjunct for uh, as we get older or, or, or at any age? So there are a handful of studies on yoga that would suggest that it may have some benefits for bone. But the majority of the way of which we practice yoga is unlikely to have significant benefits for bone health. It may help with balance, may help with coordination and flexibility, but by itself it is inadequate pressure through the bones, tendons, and muscles to stimulate bone growth. So inadequate. Got it. Um, another question, what are your general thoughts on intermittent fasting? Fasting, so, is, is this fasting like Dr. William Esser knew it? Yeah, so intermittent fasting now is a rage in our society. Uh, and it's wonderful to see that people are thinking more about their health and recognizing that three quarters of what they eat is merely paying for the salary of their doctor. And so as we're recognizing, many of us are over consuming. We're starting to say, oh, maybe a period of fasting can be a benefit. The answer is yes. Now I choose to selectively fast every night from 8 p.m. until 7 a.m., right? Or 8 p.m. until 7.30 a.m. that I don't eat or that I don't eat in the morning until I'm hungry. That is built into my life as a diurnal creature that's meant to be awake during the day and it's sleep at night. Now, if you want to do something more extended, like fasting until 2 p.m., 12 p.m., 4 p.m., fine. But I care less about when you don't eat and I care more about what you are eating when you eat. So many people are like, oh yeah, look at me, baby. I'm intermittent fasting. And then they go to Chick-fil-A or then they're having their steak or then they're having their fries. Well, that's not doing it. Sure, eating only in one or two hours a day means you have less chance to eat toxic garbage, but it doesn't mean that what you're eating is healthy or that you're particularly healthy just because you're doing it. So intermittent fasting, sure, so long as what you're eating when you're not intermittent fasting is excellent for you. The reality is a hypocaloric state long-term, low-level hypocaloric state, ends up prolonging life, reducing the risk of diseases. The studies all show this. But if you're eating a micronutrient-dense, calorie-poor, plant-based diet, you don't really have to worry about intermittent fasting uh, unless you have a sickness or an illness in that time. Got it. So you've talked a lot about fasting. And again, fasting, therapeutic fasting is in the blood. It's in your lineage and all that. You've talked a lot about it and you've said you need to get all the, if you sprain your ankle, if you do this, if you have this problem, a period of fasting of, of uh, under supervision can be beneficial. Talk a little more globally about the advantage that that can have for everyone in every condition. Yeah, I mean, so putting yourself into a state of a, a hypocaloric state, in this case, true fasting, which we would argue is physiologic rest for the entire body. True fasting is not going and working double shifts at your job and dealing with your children and family while you're just sucking down water. That's not fasting. That's kind of abuse of your body because you want all the energies of your body to be able to be used for healing, for reducing inflammation, for autophagy, for the body identifying cells that are toxic, sick, unwell, cancerous, whatever, and breaking them down. So true physiologic fasting is complete rest and complete avoidance of all unnecessary inputs, whether those be food, whether those be stress, whether those be stimulus through the eyes. And so what we're looking for there is a period, whether it be two days, whether it be 20 days, et cetera, in which you are giving the body a chance to fully and completely heal. But this requires you A, recognizing kind of your risks and B, uh, making the time for it, prioritizing your health. So if you're gonna fast for more than a day or two, it's ideal to do it under supervision because then you have the guidance to know, oh, no, 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 that's too much. We're getting a little too close to something un unhealthy, uh, as well as to have the coaching and encouragement if you're about to bail out and it's just a little bit of toxic hunger. And really, now you can have that supervision where they go, no, you're okay. Let's keep going. 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, question about the best form of CoQ10 and the selenium for heart health. Are you a fan uh, of any of those? Yeah, great question. I, you know, I'm not necessarily a fan for either of those uh, unless you have some special need for them. Uh, CoQ10 obviously is involved with the uh, energy transport chain in our bodies and mitochondrial health. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, I don't think it's making or breaking the health of an individual who's already consuming an excellent parent-based program. So it's always crucial to look at supplements. I'm going to give a talk uh, not too long on a webinar, but I also do it every month for my virtual program people on supplements, on the science of supplementation. And the reality is that supplements have a very checkered past. The majority of them have very little literature to support them, extremely mixed data. And so it's crucial that you and I understand why are we taking something and is it actually altering my disease risk? And you know, in the case of selenium, hey, if you want to knock down some selenium because you're worried about you know, COVID or your immune system's down or things like that, fine. But a long-term, there's no good long-term studies. There's no good long-term data. I'd rather you had a few Brazil nuts every day and got your selenium there, had two or three Brazil nuts, you're getting adequate amounts of selenium. So rather get these supplements, quote unquote, from your food in the natural form, because you want to remember, so for example, vitamin E, vitamin A, great studies when you look at people's consumption of vitamin E and A in their food, that they live longer, have less heart disease and fewer cancers. But the problem is those studies are associating the vitamin E and A in whole grains and fruits and vegetables. That's where they're talking about getting your vitamin E and A. But when you look at studies where they actually give people supplements of straight vitamin E or A, they actually increase their all-cause mortality. They increase their likelihood of cancers and increase their likelihood of death. So when we look at the literature, we've got to be careful that we're not just looking for something we want to find. So as people all oh, look, eating vitamin E and vitamin A, that's good for my health. Well, yeah, when it comes from plants, it is. Because it's bound up in the endosperm and the fiber. That's where we're getting that vitamin E in the whole grain. And it's coming with all these other health properties. But when you strip out the vitamin E and eat it as alpha-tocopherol, which is a chemical form of vitamin E, you increase your risk of inflammation and death. Not cool. And that's what the data shows. So the food is, uh, is where the value is, but the supplement industry is taking the credit. Absolutely. Got it. And also well, remember, supplement even in its own definition is a supplement, an addition to something that's already excellent. Many people, again, they're popping their one a day and their selenium and their this, that, and the other, and then they're going eating the sad standard American diet. That is not the answer. It is the food. It is the food, right? But the problem is that answer seems too simplistic because we've all bought into this concept that if it comes out of a bottle, a box, or a can, and if it comes from a PhD or a cool marketing, it must be powerful. When the reality is it's the food and it's the exercise that is the most powerful medicine on earth. Any supplements you recommend that people should take? Any individual who's or a long-term, yeah, 100% plant-based, long-term, get your B12, get your vitamin uh, D perhaps on the vitamin D, but 100% yes on the B12. All the other stuff is arguable, debatable, and up in the literature. So again, even stuff like omega-3s, the literature is mixed. You want to get your omega-3 out of your flaxseed, your walnuts, other places, your EPA from large quantities of deep green vegetables, knock yourself out. People like to talk about cognitive impairment long-term and people as they age not getting enough omega-3s. There are no randomized controlled trials with decades of follow-up that show that supplementing with omega-3s makes any difference on cognitive impairment. That's a problem. So there are no long-term follow-up studies with 20, 40, 50 year follow-ups on individuals showing that there's a difference. So we need that data before we give broad brush strokes and encourage people to pay money that for stuff that doesn't necessarily have evidence long-term. Lemon peels. This is an interesting question. Uh, I, is it okay to eat an entire lemon, including the peel? I eat about two lemons a day. Uh, if it's your body's tolerating it okay and you have no acidic reflux or irritability and uh, they're organic lemons, knock yourself out. Obviously, you're getting a lot of fruit pectins and you're getting a bunch of uh, citrus oils, right? Which we know actually have some potent anti-cancer effects. Uh, but if you're able to digest it and break it down well, uh, I don't see any reason not to continue with your process. Uh, for the rest of you, I probably would not add this into your daily uh, digestive. So another question just popped up from Mary Ellen. What is your treatment or recommendation for polycytic ovarian syndrome? 
Not yeah, sure so po- is, yeah, sure polycyst- it should be polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS. Uh, this is a condition in which hormones are abnormally aligned, so levels of estrogen and progesterone that lead the ovaries to have too many cysts, all these different little cysts. And these cysts be- often become painful. And then the woman has pain in her ovaries, either around the time of her cycle or even throughout uh, the month. And the first thing to do is to get on excellent nutrition. Uh, So all of the deep green vegetables, the anti-inflammatory plant-based foods, and do it for about three months. See if this reduces generalized inflammation, normalizes hormone balance. I've met many women for whom that was all that it took and everything normalized. Now, in addition to that, of course, a good fast can be outstanding. I had a girlfriend as an anecdote in college, had bad PCOS, and my grandfather said, oh, let her come fast at the ranch. She came and fasted in the summer for two weeks, and all her cysts went away. She had a repeat ultrasound, completely gone, all her pain resolved. So the body is the the mistress, the master, able to heal when you give it the right tools. First place to start, anti-inflammatory nutrition. Make sure the body mass index is less than 25. It's in a healthy place because the excess amounts of body fat lead to increased production of estrogen, which overstimulates those ovaries. Back to the orthopedics house call. Uh, Any thoughts for trigger fingers? Trigger finger is where the little tendons in the hand develop inflammation. And now as the tendon travels back and forth as you bend and extend, there's a little uh, sort of bridge it goes under called the A1 pulley. As you go back and forth, it can get caught or stuck. And so it goes, dunk, trigger, dunk, trigger, dunk, trigger. And so the first thing to do is ice, 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 arnica gel, anti-inflammatory topical creams, Again, back to excellent nutrition. See if just by doing those things, it reduces inflammation and this dies down. You may have to give it six weeks to 12 weeks, a long-term trial. If that's inadequate, then we often do injections along it. I do little dilatory injections with an ultrasound where I open up space around it and sometimes include a small amount of steroid. If these things are inadequate, then you may need surgery in order to cut that little area and free it. Remember, plant-based nutrition is outstanding. For the majority of diseases, the majority of the time, it's absolutely adequate. But other times it's not. Like when I fractured my finger and I needed six screws in it. Don't just give me the green juice, park me in the corner with a bum finger. Put the screws in it, fix it, and now give me the green juice so I heal well. Modern medicine has its place. That's why I learned it. That's why I went to Harvard. That's why I went to Mayo. The NHA is not an anti-science organization. It is a pro-science organization, pro the best science organization in the world. And that's why we're here. So use medical interventions where and when appropriate, but don't try to use them instead of your nutrition. Last question about, uh, about you, you've talked a lot about injections. So Elsmeth uh, Feldman asks, where are we at? With stem cell therapy over knee replacement surgery, should she hold out? Uh, So there are two different types of stem cells. There's autologous, meaning from your own body, either from bone marrow or fat. And there's allografts, which means from usually the neonatal stage, uh, placental tissue, cord blood, et cetera. Data on cord blood and placental tissue and the like is very poor. There's only a tiny little handful uh, of studies on this. Uh, As far as autografts, which would be the bone marrow and fat, there are quite a few studies now out showing good outcomes. I use a proprietary Italian-based system called LipoGems. They've got a beautiful website uh, that has over 100 studies now showing good outcomes in the orthopedic literature. Uh, I also do bone marrow derived stem cells. Uh, severe end-stage arthritis, what we call grade four, let's say, in the knee, stem cells probably won't help you long-term, give you six months to a year of benefit. Uh, l- low-level arthritis, like mild to moderate, well, you can get, in fact, uh, you know, two years, four years, eight years, uh, you know, benefit from stem cells. I've had hundreds of patients over the last 10 years I've done that for. A, uh, a question, this might be a question for the podiatrist, but orthopedist is close, right right up there. What do you recommend for fungal toenails? I'm completely whole food, plant-based. First thing is excellent, excellent hygiene. <clears throat> Making sure, <coughs> excuse me, you're always got dry, healthy feet. So make sure you're not in suppressive shoes that keep moisture in. You're not barefoot in boots or shoes that are moist all the time. And so keeping those feet dry as much as possible in flip-flops and sandals, get them in the sun. The next thing I like is actually tea tree oil in a very concentrated form. 
uh, but it takes a long time. You got to be very faithful two or three times a day, a couple little drops on every toenail that has the toenail fungus and do it for about six weeks. So you just grab a big old bottle of that tea tree oil, 100% pure, and you just go dip, dip, you know, drip, 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 drip. Every time you go to the bathroom, you kind of put it on, uh, certainly always after showers as well, prior to bedtime. And you just do it, do it, do it. And you may find that as you do it long term, it has a powerful effect. Uh, if inadequate, certainly some of the topical antifungals you can trial, but most of them are not that effective. Got it. All right. Well, Dr. Esser, uh, uh, it's been great. There have been a lot of great questions. There's many more that we couldn't get to, but we're at the end of the hour. But, you know, you mentioned earlier that uh, you do a uh, you have a virtual program of your own. So how do people tie into that? I do. I have a four week virtual program that I'm trying to improve every month. I've had the pleasure of doing it since last October and we continue to grow each month. I'd love everybody on this call to sign up for the April one, uh, which comes starts April the 1st. If you go to esserhealth.com backslash detox, you'll see the April, May and June events coming up. Uh, during that, you get an email every day with inspiration, encouragement. You get a video Zoom call twice a week on a different topic. Uh, and then also some Q&A sessions. So actually, when I leave you all tonight, I'm going to go do my Q&A session with my team that's doing the March program right now. Uh, exciting outcomes. We on average see 15 to 40 pounds of weight loss. We see blood pressures dropping, cholesterol dropping, joint pain improving. And of course, you have access to me throughout the month. Every night that we're on twice a week, open the floor to Q&As and take any and all questions for you know, 20, 30 minutes after my one hour talks. Are so you I'd love anybody and everybody to join us. Do you have any uh, any of your uh, juice juice detox programs? Oh, that's right. Yeah. So we've also got here, Esther's Ranch is coming back slowly. We're excited. And we can now host as of, I think as of July 1st, we'll be able to host about uh, 10 to 15 people at a time on the ranch. So we have the juice bungalow and then we have a ranch house now that's open. Uh, so we're very excited to be rolling out new real offerings in person where people can come and stay with us in beautiful Ponte Vedra Beach, Florida. And they get fresh squeezed organic juices and meals uh, multiple times a day with health education, massages, et cetera. It is really a get away from the world experience, which is what I like to give people. Uh, it's fun. We have horses uh, on site. We have beautiful walking trails. We're six minutes from the beach here. Uh, so very, very special place. 30 minutes from St. Augustine, uh, you know, really special place. So excited to offer to folks. And we'll also be offering in the months ahead some good programs out directly on the beach where people can come stay for a straight week. Uh, and look forward to having you down, hopefully, Mark, uh, as well for that. So excited for the uh, months and years ahead. So and if uh, and, and if viewers want to see even more of Dr. Esser, there's no better place than the 2022 NHA conference, June 24th to the 26th, where uh, your, your grandfather started it all and you're picking up right where he left off. They're really pretty special events. Yes. Amazing events to collaborate, to meet new people of like mind, to grow and learn, to hear speakers that, you know, are informative, inspirational, educational, transformative. You know, there's speakers on every topic, major issue, et cetera. So everybody should go to the NHA events because that's why I go. I go because I want to support an outstanding organization uh, and continue to share the message of health. That's what I love about what you're doing, Mark, with the NHA, and it is always done, which is not selling product, not marketing stuff, but educating people to achieve their best health, because truly health comes from healthy living, and that's what the NHA is all about. That's right. So June 24th to the 26th, 2022, at the Embassy Suites in Independence. It's right outside of Cleveland, where we were last year. It's a beautiful hotel, beautiful location. They do the food unbelievably, all SOS-free buffets. Uh, you'll eat to your heart's content, and uh, it's a free shuttle from the airport. It's really a great deal, and and I urge people to um, book your room at the very least by the end of this month, so that you're ensure you're in the hotel and in the room yeah. block before the room block gets filled up. But um, it's really a great event, and one of the things that you'll find is that the Dr. Esser that you're seeing here virtually, you'll see him in person, and he hangs out. He eats like with all the rest of it. He doesn't just give a lecture and leave. He's there among. Uh, he, Joel Furman said he feels it's like it's coming home. When yeah. you come to the NHA conferences. So it, it really it. is a great experience. So I hope you'll do that. Um, anything else, uh, Dr. Esser? Again, uh, where they find more information, it's Esser Health. That's your EsserHealth.com and also on all the social medias on Esser Health. Would love to have everybody join us. Wow. Dr. Esser, it's always a treat to have you again. Like I said, you're a, you're a uh, mangoes don't fall far from trees. 
and uh, your, your your grandfather was the most inspiring guy in my life, and uh, as you say, in millions of people's lives. He was he's when they when they made him, they threw the pattern away. He was a really remarkable guy. I agree. All right. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Esser. Um, Michelle, we'll go back to you. We just want to uh, share just a couple more, uh, just a couple more uh, uh, little uh, promos here. The latest issue of Health Science Magazine. If you haven't got yours, this is it. This came out back in January. If you haven't got yours, email me at mhuberman at healthscience.org. The upcoming issue is about uh, probably it's, it's being completed right now. It has an amazing interview with Dean Ornish. I've had the privilege of interviewing just just about every giant in our in our health movement. And um, the interview that I did with uh, Dean Ornish is one of the best you'll ever read. He's a remarkable guy. Uh, he, he and uh, Stefan's grandfather would have found great comfort together because they, they see the world through the same lenses. It's a great issue. There's an article in there by uh, Frank Sabatino, our new director of uh, health education on men's health. We spent a lot of time talking about women's health, but this one's on men's health. So it's a great article there. Great recipes as always. So go to healthscience.org if, you, if you're wondering whether your membership is up for renewal. We have a brand new website. If you have any problems navigating the website, email me at mhuberman at healthscience.org, uh, and I'll, uh, I'll get your password reset. We'll do that. And last, my wife Wanda told me that there are just – we have some wonderful NHA cruises coming up. And today uh, there were two cancellations for our upcoming Alaska cruise in August. Two cancellations. You will get the 2021 rate. Email Wanda at whuberman at healthscience.org and you will see the great Northwest. And uh, so it should be a great time. So again, uh, this has really been a lot of fun. Uh, Dr. Esser is a great guy. He's, a, he's, he's, um, he's, I, I think he could be an evangelist. He's so good. He's so <laughs> inspiring and uh, he's a treasure for us in the NHA. And, um, Michelle, I, I really appreciate your helping make these Power Your Health Q&As possible. So what's coming up next? Who's yeah, so we've got, yeah, we've got Dr. Will Bolshewitz is coming next. I was just double checking the date, April 26th. He's the gut, doctor. the gut doctor. The gut doctor. Yep. Uh, Fiber Fueled. He wrote Fiber Fueled. He's coming out with a new book. I think he's going to tell us about it which is really exciting. I sure wish personally that his book was around a long time ago, like 20 years ago, whenever I was struggling with my gut health, but I'm glad it's available for everyone because uh, that's the system that I use to, to heal my gut. So that's really exciting. And then in May, we have Dr. Christy Funk who's coming. So that's super exciting. Wanda and I are putting together the um, virtual part of the NHA conference as well. Don't worry, it's coming. We'll be sending you some emails and letting you know uh, about how you can sign up for the virtual conference if you can't come in person. It's going to be awesome. We're going to throw in a couple extra things that we didn't get to do last year. So improving on all that. And uh, yeah, so we'll see you guys here next. Uh, and on April 26th, uh, we stuck the links in there. If you haven't registered for the Power Your Health Q&A, if you don't have the link, uh, the reminders coming to you, you can register there. And uh, I also threw in the link for the conference as well. But you, it's on our new website, healthscience.org. We've got 250 people registered already, and we want to get to 400. And uh, now the thing people are feeling a little more comfortable about traveling uh, we've been the last couple of days, we've been getting registrations galore. So I'm really excited that we're going to have a, another great event this year. So don't miss out. Okay, yeah, Amazing. So 200, 250, it sounded like you said 50 to me, but so 250 and we want to get to 400. So yeah, guys, yeah, come on guys. It's so much fun. Dr. Esser, I was just thinking, oh man, I need to be remotivated because every once in a while I kind of start, I start to slip too. And I'm like, I'm so excited for the NHA conference. Well, my like great father said that what happens when you go to NHA conferences is even if you've been, if you've been in this lifestyle a long time, it recharges your battery. It, Absolutely. it just re-inspires you. And being around, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day about it. For, for so many of us, um, ourselves included, this is a lonely world following this lifestyle. You don't get invited to dinner to a lot of people. A lot of people don't come to your house for dinner. Um, you don't, if you're lucky, you got a couple of good friends that you can, you know, that you can share this lifestyle with. But to come together for a weekend with all like-minded people, that's pretty special. And it really does um, recharge your battery. It's pretty inspiring. And we've been doing that in the NHA for, I think this is our 73rd or 74th year. So we're, we're pretty good at it and we're only getting better at it. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's really fun to be there in person because you can hug people, you get to touch people, which is exciting. I love that. Um, last year, the virtual conference was amazing as well, though, like everybody was up in the chat and everybody really connected with one another. So it's uh, it's a great option to come virtually as well. So whatever you can do, we want you there for sure. And uh, just email us if you have any questions and we'll, we'll see you guys next time for the next Power Your Health Q&A. Thanks, Michelle. Mm -hmm. Thank you, all of you.